from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Mark Demunation. I'm Chief of the Rare Book and Special Collections Division. Uh, thank you for coming today. We're very excited about this. Uh, uh, the Division and the Library of Congress at this point have become old friends with St. John's University and especially in the making of the St. John's Bible. We're very lucky to have Tim Turnus here today to talk about uh, the extraordinary process and the undertaking of making this exquisite Bible. Nine years in the making, yes? Fifteen years in the making. Um, uh, ten years ago, the Library of Congress featured uh, selected sheets uh, from uh, the Pentateuch, the uh, first books of the Bible, uh, the Psalms, and the Gospels in an extraordinary exhibition, and I might add a very popular exhibition. Uh, today we're going to look at the, the further progress. The Bible is now complete. Uh, we're very lucky uh, on this moment to have two of what will be seven volumes of the Apostles' facsimile edition. This is an extraordinarily sophisticated facsimile. We're very lucky here at the Library of Congress to be the recipient of this, one of the 12, obviously, Apostles' edition um, that have been made. And uh, after the talk, we'll be happy to, as I always say, show you the book. <laughs> Um, and I, after you hear this talk, I'm sure you'll understand why. We'll be happy to, we'll page through the book for you rather than you doing that for yourself so we can keep this for other generations to look forward to. Um, Tim knows the story of this Bible uh, in a very intimate way and uh, you really have a lovely talk to look forward to. So I'm, uh, he's become a good friend. Uh, let's welcome, here to, welcome him here to the Library of Congress. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Oh, this is not Minnesota, that's obvious. It's a good afternoon, everyone. Jeez. I'm not used to being tethered to a podium because they've got me tied here with all these microphones and recordings, so I might be a little awkward with that as well, but I'll do my best to stay put here, which is, which is just killing me because I like to be out in front with everyone else. So It's very nice to be here. I, I've actually lectured here before and, and have shared the project with you many, many years ago in 2006 when we had it here. And I have for you just an outstanding story, an outstanding story that's been 500 years since it's been able to be told. Because the last time a monastery did something like this really was 500 years ago. And I always tell people we now know why it took 500 years to do it again. Because it's an incredibly huge undertaking. And it's also a fascinating story. Now, I'm the director of the St. John's Bible, which simply means that I am the keeper of the pages and the keeper of the story. And it really is a good job, trust me. I love what I do. I wasn't always the director of the St. John's Bible for 17 years. I was an elementary classroom teacher. So truly, one day I was, I was doing playground duty for one, one, one day, and then a few months later, I was lecturing at the Library of Congress and thought, life has changed. The behavior patterns didn't really change between the two. But trust me, life has changed for me as well. And now I'm back again, and it's really quite a treat. Because the story of the St. John's Bible, it hasn't been able to be told for many generations is a fascinating story, but it's also not our story. Because many people don't realize this thing called the St. John's Bible, which we are so famous for, and which is so famous in its own right, is something that St. John's never thought about doing, never wanted to do, and as I always say, we will never do it again. <laughs> because it wasn't our idea. The St. John's Bible is something we didn't think about doing. It was the brainchild of this man right here. Now just so you realize, that is not a picture of me. <clears throat> Many people say I look just like him. I have been walking, this is true, I've been walking down the streets of London and I have been asked for Donald Jackson's autograph. The man is 75 years old. I, I don't know how I feel about that, but it's this shared body trait that we have here as well. So. Donald Jackson, a world-renowned individual. He's a calligrapher. You think about that. He has made his fame and his fortune with something every one of you in this audience can do. You can all make letters. Think about that. Not some make nicer letters than others. I make letters. We can all do what he does. But I doubt any of us are going to have an exhibition of our handwriting that travels the globe. I doubt any of us are going to line up around the block to look at our own handwriting. And I doubt the Queen of England is going to hire you to be her professional scribe. Because that's Donald's real job. 
Donald is, by profession, the senior scribe to Her Royal Majesty's Crown Office in the House of Lords in London. Quite a long title. He's, the, he's often called the Queen's calligrapher. He's not, that's not really his job. He writes things that she gives out. So for example, he did, he did the royal charter that made Margaret Thatcher a dame of the realm. He did Charles and Diana's wedding papers. He did Charles and Diana's divorce papers, <laughs> all those things. He did not do William and Kate's wedding certificate. The only one he did not do because he was finishing and we pressed him to finish the St. John's Bible at that time. So we beat out the future king of England and his wife all the way through. But the story of the St. John's Bible is Donald's story because it was his idea. Donald talked about really having a dream of wanting to handwrite scripture from a lot earlier than anyone can ever even imagine. In fact, Donald talks about being a child and falling in love with calligraphy. Now, think what you used to do when you were 10, 12, 13 years old. And I doubt you spent time doing what Donald did. One of his favorite activities would be to go to the local museum or library, go to the rare book room, which of course you have here, go to the manuscript room, and he said, I would look at the cases and I would copy what I saw. He said, I would spend hours sitting in places like this, looking in the cases and recreating. Not tracing, but recreating. And he said, I loved it. Now think about that. And then look at this. That's a letter M that Donald did when he was about 12 years old. I was still coloring inside the lines when I was 12 years old, half the time outside the lines. That's amazing when you look at that. Here's a piece he did a couple of years later, and it does belong sideways. It's called the Reclining Madonna. But look at the difference in skill already that that child, I, I emphasize that, that that child has developed. And he said it was by going in and looking at the way the artist bent the lines, laid their gold, blended their color. He said, by looking at the masters, that's how I became a master myself. What a great lesson for all of us. And it was right around this time in his life, Donald Jackson said, you know, I'm not trying to brag, but I remember very clearly, he said, looking at something I had done one day, and it was like a light bulb went off. And he said, I realized I'm good. <laughs> and it's, just, it's like, I can do this, and I love it. And right around age 13, 13, 14, he, saw, he talks about sitting down with a piece of paper and writing two goals for his life. Now think about that. What did you want to do at age 13? <laughs> I taught elementary school for 17 years. I never once met a child who had goals, number one, but I'll, I'll be a part of that. But he sat down and said on this piece of paper, when I'm old enough, I want to work for the Queen of England. He made that happen in his 20s. One of the youngest people ever employed as a royal scribe. And number two, I bet you can guess what the other thing is on that page. It said, when I practice long and hard, and it's a paraphrase, but I practice long and hard, I want to do what calligraphers have always done hand write scripture. Think about that. What a goal. Now the first one he, got, he, he managed to make happen in his 20s, but the second one took almost 50 years to become a reality. So this was his childhood dream, and he needed a partner to make it happen, because as you can imagine, this is a huge undertaking. Well, so we have this man over in Wales with this childhood dream, and then we end up with a bunch of monks in the middle of the cornfields of Minnesota with a vision. And we have to get the two of them together somehow. And do you know what the catalyst was? Something you all love and use, but it was rocking Donald's world. In the 1980s, something changed his world dramatically. The computer. Because in the 1980s, what came into vogue? Everyone was now an electronic, electronic calligrapher. You no longer needed Donald. And as Donald always says, everyone had at their fingertips the true, dirtiest four-letter F word in the English language, the font. <laughs> <laughs> because what do you have? You can now have 50,000 ways to do his job. So calligraphy as an art form was waning. And so right around that time, a group of calligraphers in the middle of Minnesota said, we've got to find a way to stop this from happening. How can we share the passion that we have for our art form with others? Let's see if we can hold a calligraphy conference and get maybe 30, 40, 50 people, the top artists from around the world, to come to Minnesota and talk about the future of our art. And to do that, we're going to need a big name. So they contacted Donald Jackson. And they said, Donald, would you come to Minnesota and teach a calligraphy course and help us deal with this idea of our, our waning art form? One of the organizers had a grandson that happened to go to school at St. John's University in Collegeville. And they said, I know the perfect place where we can have this. 
They hired Donald Jackson, and in 1981, he came to the campus. And they got a few more than 30 or 40 people. 500 calligraphers came from around the world, and they turned our gymnasium into the world's largest scriptorium. They put Donald on the stage, he'd make a letter A, and they'd go wild. I'm serious. <laughs> he'd make a letter B, and they'd drool and scream. It was amazing. But what was most important is that's how Donald got to St. John's. And the reason the Bible is at St. John's is because Donald Jackson encountered something and saw something there that every person who comes on the campus sees and blows them away. Now, has anyone ever been to St. John's in Collegeville, Minnesota? A couple of you here, yes. What's the first thing you encounter when you come on the campus? This. This is our world-famous Abbey Church. In the 1950s, this community of monks hired Marcel Breuer, one of the, one of the first, kind of, or one of the big names in the modernist movement, to design and build their church. And the inside is even more incredible than the outside. And this incredibly beautiful mid-century modern church sits in the middle of the campus with this huge presence. And Donald said, I never knew it was there. I never knew it was there. It's an amazing building. And he said, I went in and I stood there in the middle of that church on my very first visit, looking around and he said to myself, these guys get it. He said they understand quality and they understand longevity. And not to be funny, he said, but I had concrete proof as to how they thought. <laughs> because here it is. And he said, I realized that they built this in the 50s. It was the, one of the world's, if not the world's, first contemporary Catholic church. And he said, if they understood that then, they would get this idea, this project that I, that I have in mind. Now, he let that idea percolate in his mind for 14 more years until 1985, 19, excuse me, 1995. And he said, what have I got to lose? So finally, he approached the monastery, and he sold them the idea this way. He said, what are you doing to mark the millennium? I didn't even thought about it. And he said, I've got an idea for you. How would you like the handwritten word of God, and would you help me do it? Can, can you imagine being asked that question? I mean, think, how would you respond? I mean, think about that. Well, like any church organization in the world, it took us three years to give them an answer. <laughs> because nothing works quickly in the church world. We know that. But you know, very soon it was decided that we have to do this. And in 1998 then, the formal commissioning was done. That kicked off two years of layout, planning, labor-intensive work, figuring out the first and last word of every page, making, putting together his team because he couldn't do it together fundraising, theological development, all this had to happen until finally, on Ash Wednesday in the year 2000, Donald said, everything is ready, let's begin. And he sat down and he wrote the very first words. And those first words were? In the, you're very good for a public audience, my goodness. <laughs> well, let me introduce Donald Jackson to you with a short video. It will introduce his tools, his methods, his materials, and you will get to see his hands at work. And they're very distracting because he's so good with his hands. But also pay attention to what he says because he really explains how he sees his role in this Once in a Millennium project. And that's as loud as we can get it, I'm sorry.
Yes, we do love Target in Minnesota as well. It's a good video, isn't it? it? It's well done and it does so much in such a short amount of time. I've seen that video about 3,000 times. I can narrate it word for word if it ever goes out. But I always tell myself every time I've seen it, you know, if I really take it seriously and practice long and hard, if I really work at it, you know, maybe someday, maybe someday I can learn how to separate an egg the way Donald Jackson did. <laughs> it's amazing when he does that and he does it to make sure that when he puts it in the bowl, it remains perfectly pure. Because you want to go for something that's going to last 2,000 years. Think of the last thing Father Eric said in the video. As old and as wonderful as this building is, as amazing as that church is, there's a good chance this book, because of the way it was made, because of something as simple as what I'm holding in my hand right now, it will outlast all of this and that. Because we didn't use traditional tools, methods, and materials to recreate the past. We didn't do this as a, as a history project. We chose to use the things that are in this box because there are still, there's still no better way to do it today if you want it to last. So what's in the box? Now, some of you will know, but many of you, you can hear it. You probably can't see it very well, but it's very small. When I show it to my college students, they all think it's a jump drive, <clears throat> the modern world, yes. But of course, it looks more like what's on the screen now. Anybody know what it is? Yes, this is a stick of ink. And the inks for the Bible are actually quite unique and quite rare. You can pass them around if you'd like to and handle them. The inks for the Bible are quite special. Number one, my favorite part about the inks for the Bible is that, number one, they're very old. They're made in the 1870s. And number two, Donald Jackson bought every stick of ink he would need for the Bible over 40 years ago. Now remember, he didn't come to us with the idea until 95, but he came across these beautiful sticks of black ink in a place that was going out of business in England, in London, and they were selling these ink sticks for pennies a piece. And he said, they were just beautiful. He said, so I bought every one they had, just in case. 40 years ago, he bought 144 sticks of this beautiful black ink. 45, 40 some years later, he used 142 sticks of black ink. He had two to spare. Isn't that amazing? I love it. Now, the beautiful, they're, they're beautiful sticks of black ink. We couldn't afford them today because he bought them for pennies a piece. They sell for many hundreds of dollars nowadays, these beautiful sticks of black ink. Why? Why do you think they're so rare and so expensive? Well, partly is because of what it is. Now, don't give any answers away, Mark, because I know you know this. But think about this. Think black. Think 1800s. I heard someone, I have teacher ears. I can hear anything. I heard someone whisper over here, coal, coal. <laughs> mm -hmm. Not coal, because look at your hands. Anyone have, anyone have black hands from passing around a stick of coal? No. What are you passing? What, what is that black ink? Ah, yes. You think about it, you are truly passing around a stick of candle smoke from the 1870s. Think about that. Candle smoke. Go home, light a candle, let it burn for three or four hours, blow it out, put your hand above the candle, let the smoke hit your hand. What color will your hand be? Black. That is soot. That is lamp black, collected from the 1870s. Now, if you've ever touched the wick of a candle, you're, of course your hand is going to be black. So it can't just be soot. What else is in there? If it was wax, it would resist when you wrote. Think natural, think sticky. What's going to be the glue? Honey, yes. A very common recipe would be soot, honey, but that's still not going to keep it from rubbing off on your fingers. Think of the video. Yes, egg white. A common recipe for, for Chinese black ink was soot, honey, and egg white. You mix it together, you compress it together in your mold, and you bake it 
and you get this beautiful stick of um, ink. You put on a grinding stone with a bit of water and you grind it down. The water breaks down the honey and the egg white. The soot stains the water black. You write, the water evaporates. And have you ever let egg dry on a plate? It becomes part of whatever it holds. The proteins in that egg bind it permanently to any surface. Something simple and beautiful and natural. The colored inks are just as beautiful. The reds are solid cakes of vermilion. The blues are ground lapis. And the greens are ground malachite. And these, these elements will not break down any further because they are already at their natural state. I mean, think about the black has already been burned. Think about that. It's, not go it's going to be as beautiful today, or in, in a thousand years, as it is today. These materials have proven themselves. Go look at the manuscript room in this building. These materials have proven themselves over the centuries. And then you'll notice that Donald used the egg yolk. Well, you mix the egg yolk with the warm colors and the egg white with the cool colors. And then they will also keep them vibrant and wet looking and brilliant for centuries to come. And then, of course, if you have this ink, you need the most perfect tool for writing. And believe it or not, the St. John's Bible was written with a turkey, a swan, or a goose feather. Can you imagine writing anything with this, let alone millions of letters? I mean, that's incredible. But the first thing Donald will tell you, that no quill in the history of the world ever looked like this. This is a TV quill, folks. <laughs> exactly. Because what, what artist or anyone, what calligrapher would ever write with this thing in the way the whole time? I mean, plus your pen is unbalanced, so this as you saw in the video, is what a real quill looks like. But as Donald always says, this isn't sexy enough for TV, so you always see it. You can pass this around. But also you have to realize that you really cannot write with a feather. Because as you heard, this is the same substance as what? Your fingernails. It has no strength or durability. This is not going to last, especially if you cut it into a quill. So you have to do something to this to make it worthy of being this. So here's what you do. You take this quill and you clip off the end, clean out the viscous on the inside, you soak it in water for about 24 hours. Take it out, dry it off, and then you bake this in hot sand for about two minutes at 350 degrees. Roll it around, take it out, and when the bottom is clear, it will have been <coughs> clarified, and that quill will last for centuries. Donald's favorite quill pen that he used was 135 years old. And he would simply re-nib re it every once in a while and do it. And so once you have this beautifully car um, um, cured, clarified, you cut it into your pen, and you have the most perfect tool for writing. So now you know the secret. If you want fingernails that never break, you need to bake them for two minutes at 350 <laughs> degrees. You get history and beauty tips today. You didn't get that as well. But think about that. And Donald said, on average, we, I bet we used about 40 quills in the entire project because they're so durable as you go all the way through. Quite beautiful and very elegant. And I love this next slide because if you look at it, it shows you what an artist can do with an old turkey feather and some candle smoke. I mean, think about that. When you see the pages, and if you ever get a chance to see the real pages, remember that. Turkey feather and a candle smoke. It's pretty incredible. But this page also, this slide also shows you the next major decision we had to make for longevity. And if you look at the bottom, <clears throat> you look right here, the support. That's what you call the surface in calligraphy or any, any artwork, basically. We, if we're going for a 2,000 year history, we obviously can't be writing on paper. So we have this. It's going to be real great in the microphone, isn't it? We have this beautiful. Very durable surface. I could do this. About a million people have taken this in museums and gone like this to this poor little thing. Do you know what it is? Vellum. Yeah, it's vellum, but that's not what I asked. I said, do you know what it is? What's vellum? I heard someone say sheepskin. Well, you know, there's a whole, I'm sure Mark and I'll argue about this as well. There are all kinds of different things of people. But if you think about it, the word veal comes from the Latin word vellum. And this is real vellum, and so this happens to be skin. And before anyone gets mad at me, we did not kill a bunch of baby cows for the Bible. We do, no, we do not have a herd hidden behind the Abbey Church branded Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and so on. This came from veal production in the United Kingdom. 
and as you, as you look at this, and the, and the manufacturer's name was Cowley, Cowley at Pegnell, which is a great name. And they make parchment and vellum and so on for the Houses of Parliament and so on and different documentation. But what the benefit of this beautiful surface is, is that it's incredibly durable. But most importantly, it's going to long, last a long time, but it's got a special benefit for us humans. Ah, think about that. You'll find out later if you haven't thought about it yet. It's because we're human, we love this stuff. So think about that. Now, as you're, feeling, as you're petting the cow as it comes around, all right, did you notice that one side feels fuzzy and one side feels smooth? Well, that's the inside and outside of the cow. And my question for you as a scribe, on which side of the skin are you going to write for the pages of the book? Oh, someone's thinking, yes, both. You turn the pages of a book, don't you? Yes. So you're going to write on both sides of the skin. So forgive my, um, my paper skin here, but this is, one si this is about the size of a skin on the cat. And we fold it in half, and from one skin, we get four pages in the St. John's Bible, which also gives us the size of our book. But there's a reason we have a big book, and it's a theological reason. Because we could have saved a lot of cows if we'd folded that in half again, and half again, and half again. We could have gotten 32 pages from one poor little cow. But why didn't we? Why didn't we? Well, the, the size of the script would be very small, but you know what? Go up in the, up in the archives, you'll see tiny, tiny print that's really quite amazing. And actually, we have some pages that are written pretty tiny. Why wouldn't we do a book like this? Pardon? It's not yeah, but there's, it's play with that. It won't last. Well, if, if it's the same materials. But think about it. What does this say? It actually says the same thing that this says. Who's this for? This is, in fact, I even use this like this sometimes, don't I? Think about it. Think about what this says. Who is this for? Who is this for? This is mine. And one of the major th reasons we did the St. John's Bible is to remind us that you know, even this says, this is mine. But what does this say? <laughs> this says, you can't even lift me by yourself. I mean, think about that. What does this say? This says it is ours. ours. It's collectively ours. And one of the main theological elements of the St. John's Bible is that we did this project to remind people that the Bible is communal. And what says more communal than something very large? And, and as you said, sir, magnificent. In fact, because it's communal and because it's so big, it cannot even possibly be one volume. The St. John's Bible takes seven books this size to make the entire Old and New Testament. And so imagine what it says. And the first time the Bible is bound and carried into the Abbey Church, when it takes 14 people to carry the Bible. <laughs> Does that ever make a statement about the importance of what we think about this? And also the importance of it as a communal work of art. And in fact, that's the primary reason we did this, is yes, to ignite the imagination, yes, to, to, to celebrate the millennium, but to remind us as a people that this is a communal work that's best experienced shared. We could spend truly the rest of the afternoon talking about the minutiae that went into the, the layout of the pages, the design of everything, because the detail that went into making the original is almost overwhelming. There's one last thing we should talk about before going into the book, and that was the most difficult decision in the entire project. And do you know what that is? Pardon? You're close. We always knew it was going to be English. Which translation do we use? Because no matter which translation we choose, it will be the wrong one. Simple as that. We know what that's like. Well, we had a lot of thought into this. And we wanted a translation that was literal, that was scholarly, that was inclusive, that was approved for use by the Catholic Church and so on. We are Roman Catholic. But we wanted it to be a translation that was used by as many others as possible. And so with that in mind, we chose to go with the new 
Revised Standard Version, or the NRSV. And that has become the most perfect choice for us. It is literal, it is scholarly, it is inclusive, but many of you may or may not know that the NRSV happens to be one of the only translations of the Bible in English that is officially approved for use by almost every major Christian church worldwide. And many non-Christian traditions, when and if they ever need a translation, will often go to the NRSV. Now, it's very seldom that other trans traditions do, but they will often use that one. And so it has become the most perfect choice for us. Now, it is the entire Old and New Testament, all 73 books of the Bible, even a few that some of you might have left out at one time. <clears throat> Just keep that in mind. It includes the apocryphal books as well. In the Catholic tradition, we, inc we include the apocryphal or the deuterocanonical books as well in the canon. Other than that, it's like every other NRSV you've ever read or ever, ever seen, Ours is just a lot prettier all the way through. Now, along with these beautifully handwritten pages and this whole idea of a communal work, we wanted to bring the St. John's Bible into a new translation, but not a word translation, a visual translation. And so what we did is we incorporated over 160 artworks designed to bring the scriptures into the modern world through the way that many people in the modern world experience almost everything nowadays, visually. So for the remainder of our time, we're going to look at a few of the artworks. Actually, we're going to get you looking at a few of the artworks. And we don't have time to read the passages today, so I've chosen one that I bet almost everyone in this room knows, even if, you're, even if you've never read the Bible, or the Torah, or the Koran, even if you're a strong believer or not a believer at all, if you're a skeptic or a, you know, a hardcore literalist, I bet you know the creation story. Think about it. Because I bet I could stop the first stranger on the street and ask him or her, by biblical or Torah tradition, how many days are in creation? And almost everyone's going to answer seven, even if they never read it. I could ask the next stranger on the street and ask them by biblical or Torah tradition, who are the first human beings? And almost everyone's going to answer Adam and Eve. Because those passages, those stories that are shared by many traditions are as much a part of popular culture as they are religious culture. In fact, we have court cases taking place right now about them as well. They're some of the most argued about passages in the Bible. Now let's keep all that in mind and then pretend for a few moments that you are the artists for the St. John's Bible. And St. John's has come to you and said, we want you. We've chosen creation. Now, we know creation has already been shown a thousand times throughout history. There are probably more images of creation than there are of anything else. Try to go to any museum in the world and not see a picture of Adam and Eve. I mean, think about that. Now, as artists, St. John's comes to you and says, guess what? We've chosen creation. We want you to make a brand new image of creation. We want you to make it literal so people know it's creation, but we also want you to weave in modern science and modern values. We want to make sure that in a 500 years from now, people know it's creation, so make sure it's prophetic and don't make anybody mad. Okay? <laughs> and also, it's a Bible, so you're going to have to deal with the concept of the divine. And if we're making pictures, you might as well get this over with right away. Figure out how you're going to image God. I mean, think about, think about just that one assignment. How do you make an image of the divine and not make somebody mad? Well, that's exactly what we asked the artist to do. So what I'd like you to do now is I'm going to show you that artwork. And I want you to sit in silence for about 30 seconds and just look at it and ask yourself, what do I see? Don't talk to your neighbor, just look at it. There's creation. Now turn to the person next to you and just talk about it. Tell them what you see.
I love watching people talk about this. It's like watching a whole bunch of choir directors. You all start going like this and you put, because it does draw you in, doesn't it? What's the first thing that somebody saw? You know, almost everyone sees the seven slices. Why, ma'am? Seven days. Yeah. We said make it literal, didn't we? Yep. What else do you see? Chaos. Okay, what do you see, ma'am, that says chaos? What do you see? Okay, where do you see it? Ah, you're seeing chaos on the left. Anyone else? What do you see on the left that makes you say chaos? Some intrusion. Intrusion less? And I see Hebrew words. Oh, yeah. oh, interesting. So what, anybody here read Hebrew? Yeah. Okay, all right. Well, even if we don't read Hebrew, what could it say? In the beginning, it would be very nice. It could say K-O, chaos. <laughs> could say tohu bohu, which means? Formless void, nothingness, chaos, yeah? Why is it there? In the beginning, that's what there was. Oh, and there's a passage in the Gospels that say, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God. Yeah. Could begin there. Yeah. Could be there. Yeah. What else do you see? Well, the bird, like the spirit, goes across more than one oh. of the panels. Okay. She said the bird, like the spirit, goes across more than one of the panels. Oh. Okay. Well, uh, what kind of bird is it? All right, I'm going to be mean. You said dove. Why is it dark blue? Is it the voice of God? Why is it dark blue? I make a dove white. I don't know about you, but maybe I'm too literal. You know, sometimes they just did to make artistic decisions. So you could see the stupid thing. Simple as that. Exactly. <laughs> What else could it be? You know, it could be a raven. In many cultures, the raven's a sacred bird, and it's a sacred messenger. It, it could be a shadow, which means it's where? That whole idea of hover, watching over us, hovering. That's a possibility, too. Beautiful. What else do you see? You both talked about squares at the same time. To look at those squares and talk to the person next to you about everything those squares do, building on what he just said. Because they do something else, too. Ah, you often don't, exactly, you don't, ah, they're everywhere, aren't they? What do the squares do? Oh, someone said they assemble. They, someone said they make a triangle. Do you see it? Seven, seven, seven. And a triangle is often used. Trinitarian, exactly, and maybe depending on your cultures, what else? They also, yeah, they create straight lines. They impose order. You know if they also count? They go from one to two to three. And over here, someone said they hinge. Why are the tri why are the why are the gold squares there? They do hold it together, don't they? Why are the gold squares there? What do they represent? Think of everything you just said. Order. order. The story is about imposing order. Who imposed order? Unity. Unity, order, strength. strength. Beautiful. Anything else you see that catches your eye? Go ahead. Back. Yeah, very much so. Now, would you like me to tell you a few things about this page? No, seriously, would you like me to tell you? Because <clears throat> be careful with that answer. <laughs> and here, if you remember nothing else about this talk today, remember this next statement. The St. John's Bible is not a picture book. These are not meant to be didactic illustrations of the stories. They're not meant to say, here's what it means. So we are very careful. We never tell you what it means unless we ask you if you want to. Because what's more important is the fact that each of these engages you to talk to others to find meaning. And if you're talking to others to find meaning, that's a definition of 
community, the reason we did this. These artworks are designed to be invitations in, to be visual spiritual meditations. And we hope that maybe some people will read the words that are there too. We hope that they could enter you in. But if you don't, no big deal. Because what you were talking about was the passage anyway, on different entry points. But we're human, we're nosy, we want to know what the artist was thinking, so I'll tell you a few things. Most people notice it begins in chaos and disorder, darkness. Many people um, talk about the Big Bang. We said weave in modern science, modern values. The, the Hebrew does read tohu vabohu, very so formless void, nothingness. These irregular shapes, anybody recognize those? Those are mathematical fractals. Scientists use fractals in chaos theory. You can use fractal geometry to mathematically calculate how a tree branch is going to grow. So even amidst the chaos, there's an underlying sense of order. The second slice moves into the creation of the heavens and the seas. The third slice is correct, ma'am. It's a satellite image of the Ganges River Delta because we have the formation of land and sea, or um, separation of land and waters. Then we move into the third one, or the fourth one, the sun to rule by day and the moon to rule by night and all the stars in between. And did you notice the planetary orbits? Had Donald Jackson put those into a Bible 800 years ago, the church would have locked them away in prison. Simple as that. We understand that we revolve around the, the, uh, the, earth, the sun right now. Then you move into creation of birds and fish and other animals, and you've got that beautiful dark bird hovering over. I thought your description of it was elegant. Then the creation of human beings. And if you look very carefully, many of those human beings you may have seen before. They are very primitive. They come from famous cave paintings. But one of them is very important. And that is this woman. It's a huntress. It comes from a cave painting in Nigeria. It's one of the oldest images of a female we have on the planet. And she graces the page of the St. John's Bible because in the modern world, we understand the equality of men and women. Centuries ago, many of you in this room wouldn't have been imaged that often in a sacred work like this. And then did you see the bottom? No one mentioned him. The little troublemaker down there. Do you see the little stinker sitting there? Yes. That little snake saying, look what's coming around the corner, folks. And then it gives way to this day of order, structure, and rest. <coughs> But none of you talked about the biggest discussion of all. Where is God? Remember, we said, figure out how to image God. That, you're right, ma'am, that is tough. Ah, very good. That's a very political answer on Capitol Hill. <laughs> yes, but you're right. Well, we decided early on that we would never make an image of the divine. Who are we to say what God looks like? But we would show you the divine. What is the only thing you see present in every single day? What did you say? The gold squares. And what did you say they do? They built, they provided order, they provided structure, they connected things together, they form a triangle. We decided early on in the, in the tr manuscript tradition of illumination to use the play of light on the precious metals as you turn the page to represent the divine. So whenever you see gold, it's the representation of God. And in the original, we have many times polished it. So much so, what else will you see? Yourself. And what does scripture say? We're all made in the divine image. And so it's our way of anyone who looks at the, at the book will see the image of God he or she should see that reflected in each of us. That's just the first page, folks. I mean, think about that. I mean, it can, every page goes on that way. And you know, did you notice what else the gold squares do? They give you a hint of the theology. Because look, this connects here, this connects here, and so on. But look, these connect. It's not done yet all the way through. Donald Jackson did that entire work of art on his own, with the exception of the snake. He hired natural history artist Chris Tomlin to paint the snake, and he said, make it beautiful, because many people find evil attractive. <laughs> you turn the page, and you enter the Garden of Eden. Here it is on the page. Let's enlarge it. What do you see on the background? Do you see? The entire creation story is recreated again from the seven panels down to the tiny gold squares. And now you see everything all together there. The woman is back, but so is that snake. And it's getting larger and causing all kinds of problems. And then you turn the page, and you finally meet Adam and Eve. Think of every Adam and Eve you've ever seen in the world. You probably haven't seen many like ours. 
Here they are on the page. Let me zoom in. We have this beautiful couple. Are they black? Are they white? Are they African? Are they Asian? We don't know. And I'm sorry, but much to every Minnesotan's dismay, they probably were not blonde-haired, blue-eyed. But what do we have here? The snake is also back. And look how it's changed. The snake has now become part of them. It's in the jewelry. It's in the necklace. It's in their eyebrows. Do you notice that? It even creates a dividing line between the two of them. But more importantly, what else has changed? Looking at their expressions. Yes, the expressions are very changed. But something you've seen all the way through has now Ah, the gold is dramatically changed. Do you see in the, in the Garden of Eden? It's all surrounding them. And now if you look at Adam and Eve, it's broken. It's dull. It's hard and present. There's, there's, there's a new covenant. The covenant is in book. Every one of the artworks in the St. John's Bible compels you to tell a story and invites you in. And we're often asked, who came up with the idea? How do they begin? Well, enter in the committee. There we are, yes. This is the Committee on Illumination and Text, the CIT. And this group of theologians, artists, and scholars chose the passages, and then they visually brainstormed them, typed up notes for the, for the artists, and gave them suggestions. Can you imagine giving an artist a suggestion on how to do his or her work? Mm -hmm. They would email that over to the artist, because remember, St. John's is in Minnesota. The artists are in Monmouth, Wales. They would get those, begin their own scripture study, begin playing with the notes, and then they would start sketching. Here is the sketch for creation. Sometimes they would make it in collage form so they could move things around. Then they would sometimes just do it in sketches. Here are sketches for Adam and Eve. <clears throat> they would do these sketches, make a mock-up, and then take pictures of it and email the pictures to St. John's. The committee at St. John's would read, look at them, and type up feedback for the artist. They'd email the artist the feedback. The artist would roll his eyes <clears throat> and type up feedback on our feedback and email it back to us. We'd roll our eyes and type up feedback on his feedback and mail it back. It would go back and forth like that for anywhere between four to eight months for every single image. Once both sides of the ocean said, these are theologically and artistically sound, not right, but sound, then they would do them on the vellum. And that's how they actually look side by side in the Bible. Absolutely beautiful. Take that process times 160 artworks, and you can see why this took 15 years to create. Pretty amazing. Now, along with the beautiful pages of, of elegant artworks, most of the work in the St. John's Bible is 1,130-some pages of elegant text. And here is this page. And the first thing you'll notice, and the first thing, your first thing you'll learn when you look at a page like this, is that you never call this a font. <laughs> this is a script, or as Mark said, a hand. <clears throat> because a computer does a font, or a machine does a font, or it's a creative thing. This is a hand, a beautifully written hand. There are six calligraphers in the St. John's Bible, each of them working to make sure their hands looked as much alike as possible. But you can tell the difference. Look at their tails. Look at their pressure. And the humanity of the hand comes out very easily and very beautiful. You'll also see that throughout the St. John's Bible, the very beginning, we use flora and fauna from Africa, Mesopotamia, the Middle East. Because, of course, that's what most likely it probably started there. But as you turn the pages in the St. John's Bible, for most of the rest of the book, the plants and animals come from central Minnesota. <laughs> and we change all the amens to Yashur, you betcha, for the whole Bible as well. So. We didn't change a word, trust me, trust me. But we do weave those things, just as they would centuries ago, into the pages of the Bible so it geographically grounds it in our work. Now, a page of script like this takes one calligrapher between 7 to 13 hours to write. Think about that. And then we also get the common question. What happens if you make a mistake? You are human. And remember I said you're very happy you're working on a cow. Because cows are very forgiving. If you make a mistake in the St. John's Bible, 
you go right back to your process. Take your knife, scrape it away, take sandpaper and sand it off, and you will never know it was there. Isn't that amazing? That's one of the very big benefits of using the vellum. However, let's say you make a mistake in the same place again. Or let's pretend that you left out an entire line. You don't catch it till later. And remember, if I make a mistake here, I've made a mistake on four pages. So you don't throw it away. So sometimes you make a mistake that's too big to cover up. And if you do, you turn it into something nice. Here is the very first mistake in the St. John's Bible. Here's our sower and the seed. And this page was done backwards because almost always the calligraphy was done first and the artist did his or her work. But Sally was ready, wasn't ready to write and the artist was ready, so they did the artwork first and then Sally wrote around it. And when she got to the bottom of this column, she discovered something pretty terrible. This column ended up one line longer than this column. She had left out an entire line. And they would have had to scrape a fourth of the page off and they couldn't do this. And Sally said, I was pretty sure I was about to lose my job. And Donald said, don't worry, we're going to fix it the same way they did centuries ago. So look at the page. As you read down the column, you come to a tiny red triangle right there. That red triangle points back to the bird. The bird's feet are holding a rope, the rope travels down, and it's wrapped around the line, which is missing, saying, oops, it belongs up there. So you read it, and the crowd came together again so that they could not even eat. When his family heard it, they went out to restrain him. Isn't that wonderful? That is a legitimate way of fixing a mistake in a manuscript. And they've done it that way for centuries. Here's a book of ours from the Walters Art Museum collection that's several centuries old. And look at that little monk. He's saying, oops, this line belongs up there. Isn't that wonderful? I love that one. This is how they've done it for centuries. Because you can't just toss these away. Out of 1,130 pages, we have nine corrections. Isn't that amazing? How many mistakes were in the last email you sent? I mean, think about that. Yeah. One of my favorites is this one. Look at the bumblebee at the bottom. He's attached to a pulley system, pulling it up into place. And this is a fantastic one, too. There's a little lemur, which does not come from Minnesota, but he's doing his, doing his job as well. Yeah. There is a wideness in God's mercy. Very much so. In fact, yeah. One of the one of the biggest discussions was should we make them redo these pages? And it was one of our oldest monks that said, No. We have the word of God, let's take every chance to admit we're human. And so they have. Sally Mae Joseph was the artist that made the very first mistake in the St. John's Bible that was there. And she said, I felt just awful. Here I am doing this until Donald Jackson made the second mistake. And she said, that was the day I got religion because I knew there was a God, she said. <laughs> As we go all the way through. We could spend hours talking about the pages of the Bible. We could spend hours taking a look at how you know, ancient stories are brought to life, weaving in beautiful context where you have the Christ's family tree, acknowledging the fact that we share common roots beginning with Jesus all the way back to Abraham with Sarah and also Hagar listed. The St. John's Bible welcomes other traditions. Do you notice the structure of the family tree is written on a menorah? And that menorah is lit with Islamic arabesques. Behind it, a swirling mandala. Beneath it, or connecting all, everything over here together to a Christian cross. Acknowledging the fact that we all share a common root back to Abraham. The St. John's Bible weaves in modern science. Look at the background of this artwork, and you will see very clearly that in the modern world, yes, we understand our genealogy as a family tree, but we also understand it through our DNA. The entire background of the St. John's of this artwork is over a pattern of beautiful <laughs> DNA, and the DNA is absolutely everywhere. The St. John's Bible is an amazing work of art, and you've heard the story of this, but one thing that's really unique about the St. John's Bible is that for one of the first times in the manuscript world, a commission like this is done. It was finished on May 9, 2011. We wrote the last words. It took 23 individual artists 
15 years to create. At the same time the original was being made, St. John said, we have to find a way to share it beyond our, beyond our doors. And so we created the finest fine art edition we can possibly imagine of a lithograph copy on paper that recreates the look, the feel, the texture, oh, I guess the, 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 the quality of longevity of the inks and the materials. It recreates the texture of the gold. Even the fiber of the paper is designed to mimic the way the vellum turns. And these 299 copies, fine art editions, are known as the Heritage Edition. And the Library of Congress and the American people have been given one of those fine art editions called the Apostles Edition. And it was delivered. I had the privilege of, of delivering, I'm going to skip a couple things here. I had the privilege of delivering this volume when it was brought to the, United, brought to, um, the Library of Congress um, in a few months ago when Pope Francis was here. And it was delivered and given to the American people. Today, you have two of those volumes which have been delivered. Over the next few, several months, all seven will be delivered and will, will create a permanent home here at the Library of Congress as well. I will be delivering each volume. That's, that's, that's up to Mark. <laughs> Trust me, because I've only scratched the surface on the stories that I know. I know I have gone a bit longer than I said I would, Mark. I'm sorry. But if there are any questions, I will stick around and answer them if you want to answer them now. But I want you to think about one thing before you close today. The St. John's Bible is this incredible work of art. But as I've said many times, it is a complete waste of time, money, and talent if it's never used. In a thousand years from now, I don't want to see a clean book. I want to see it ripped. I want to see it licked. I want to see the pages explored. Sorry, Mark. <clears throat> I want to see it used. Because the legacy of the St. John's Bible won't be the fact that we made it. The legacy of the, of the St. John's Bible will be what we choose to do with it. So do something with it. If nothing else, just enjoy it. Thank you very much for your time here today. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.